Hello again, this is Tom Malloy, uh, Teaching Bankroll, a new approach to financing feature films. Um, I want to talk to you about number seven, which is investor relations. Uh, I, I think the topic of the course, it, what, what they said is how to create and keep them for future films. Um, okay. <laughs> Keeping them tough, right? Okay. The thing that, uh, that I teach in my book is, that, uh, is how to raise the money. Keeping them involves making them money, <laughs> you know, on the back end. Now, that's another thing. Like I said, if you raise $20 million for films and you, uh, all the films bombed horribly, you were still extremely successful at raising money. Um, when I talk about investors, you know, we talked about this a little bit before. The key is communication, communication, and which is tough. You know, if it's, if it's one guy that did your film, that's easy. If it's 40 investors, like I have on my dance film, you know, north of $6 million, we had 40 different people almost. No, 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 it was about 30 different people, I'm sorry, that were investing in the film. It's tough, especially if they're talking amongst themselves. And like I said, when people don't hear from you, they create crap. They start saying, oh, this, there's a problem. You know, all the film's not gonna go to video. You know, it's not gonna be in theaters that much longer. And they start talking. I don't know why, but it comes along with a money investment that people think you're gonna screw them or they think that the money's gonna be lost. So you have to communicate. Literally, even with the bad news, folks, don't, you know, you can sugarcoat it a teeny bit, but not too much. Like I said, I've had producer friends that have done that and sugarcoated too much. And then later down the road when they're confronted, well, you told me it was gonna make a million in foreign sales. It made 100,000 in foreign sales. It's like, well, that's pretty bad, you know? But if you told them it was gonna make 300,000 in foreign sales and it made 100,000 in foreign sales, that's not as bad, you see? So the key is communicate as best you can. The business plan is such a, um, is writing it is such a kind of a, almost like a procedural thing but it also has to be this you know you have to know the investor it ba it's based on the person you see what i'm saying so it's almost like you're painting a picture for him or her right uh okay so on the business plan itself i always start and i don't know how if this is the, the lead page or is always oh, executive summary obviously you know you're going to have your cover sheet and uh, then you're going to go to your executive summary right which is your bulleted pointed list of information about the film right uh you know xyz productions wishes to make the film uh the brown chair uh the, the light brown chair the brown chair um you know in 2009 right so there's your line and then bullet points um we have attached director john smith who directed the successful film the brown wall right and you know there's your first bullet point second bullet point we um we're shooting in New Mexico for 25% tax credit. Boom. Third bullet point, we have put together a risk management scenario that you are guaranteed the most risk to the investor is 20 cents on the dollar. So you're guaranteeing 80% back with tax credits and foreign sales and blah, blah, blah. Okay, fourth, um, the investor receives the title of executive producer uh, and, you know, well, we'll get into detail. And so, and 125% of the film, um, which let me back up for a second. I'm just trying to go through some potential bullet points. And there's ones in my book and we can go over some more. Um, and then it really specify up there how the money's gonna be broken out. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll put it in one line and then say see appendix so-and-so or see hypothetical investment return, wherever that is in your book. Hypothetical meaning you're not promising anything because you can get into big trouble if you say, you know, investment return. <laughs> and then, you know, when your film doesn't make 40% ROI, you, some, suddenly you get a lawsuit. So it's hypothetical investment return. Um, but, you know, and this, it, going into, I don't know how many specific details um, you want to go into, but basically what I'm saying is normally, most of the time, I do a, with my business plans, is I do 125% return to the investor before anybody else sees a dollar. We can go even to more specific that I did use on, um, I think I might have done it on Attic and Alphabet Killer. We did a 90-10 corridor, which is an interesting little thing. That's, that's a side note. Um, Okay, so say the film is a million bucks. I'm always going to use a million so I can do quick math. And uh, you, so the bottom line is you, you gave me a million dollars, right? The movie sells for $2 million, right? Uh, and if anybody needs to slow down or whatever, let me know. I can go over this again. But uh, so a million dollars, we, we just made, we got a sale to Sony, bought, at, bought it out. Worldwide rights bought it out for $2 million, right? So the first thing that the investor gets back is $1,250,000, right? No one else has seen anything. Side note real quick, not to get off focus, but if I did a 90-10 quarter, that means 10% would go to the production company at the same time, which, which I'll go into in a second. That gets a little hairy at, at the point, but uh, 
90 10 quarter is really cool. Um, so now, so you get uh, $1,250,000. So that leaves a $750,000 left, right, at, at that point. Uh, then we split 50 50, right? 50% 50 goes to the investor, 50% goes to the production company. You got to make sure they know that too. They don't, you know, you want to make them understand that you're not getting 50% of the profit as well, you know, that you're, that. 50% is coming to the production company, meaning that he's made, he invested a million dollars. He made $1,250,000. He can add now $325,000 uh, so onto there. So you've made $1,575,000. I had to do that real quick. Am I right? $1,575,000 on your, you know, so you made a 57.5% return. That's huge, right? Okay. So the other, that other three hundred twenty-five goes to the production company, which are, split amongst the producers, the director, the writer, the actors, blah, 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 right? So you have a big, you know, a big, uh, we can ask, well, we'll do a question afterwards, yeah. Um, a big pool of people that it's going to. You know, look, at the end of the day, if you're producing a film, uh, if you walk away with 15%, that's really, really high. And a great point, which I talk about in the book, is that if you're doing multiple things, you got to get paid for those things, you know? I, a lot of times I'm writing the script and acting, and I, and I knew the acting was taken care of because that's through SAG, so I didn't have to, you know. But the writing, when I did The Attic, it was like, oh, I got one little fee for the producing and writing together. And it's like, it took me a while to figure out, like, those are two different people. Producer Tom and writer Tom are two different people. Doesn't matter I wrote the script. If you and I, somebody tried it, my producer partner tried it on Love and Dancing. It was like he wanted to get the same fee as I did, and he was just producing it. Well, I was producing, I was writing it. And I was like, well, you got to understand here, though, then we have a partnership in all of producing. It's like, if we hired a writer, we'd be paying that writer, like through the guild and stuff like that. So it's like, you can't, and it helped when I got in the writer's guild, obviously they can't, you know, there's like a writer's guild, like a minimum 60,000 a script, but it's like, it, or they tried to reduce my producer fee. You know, I think that's what he was trying to do is saying like, make it less so that we're equal. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> just because I wrote the script, it's just the first, that, that Tom, writer Tom is not the same as producer Tom. Why is that person going to wire you the check, write you the check, give you the money? Why are they going to do it? And find that out. In sales, they call it finding their pain. What is their pain? What do they want to be sold on? Same here. What is their vested interest? All right, I know that the guy in Rochester put the final thing in because it was like, so we had Tim Hutton, we had Kerry Owens, we had Michael Irons, like, nothing. Suddenly it was just like, wait, Eliza Dishku's on your list? We didn't even have Eliza at the top of our list. I'll, I'll admit that, you know, we didn't even have her. We had so many people above her. And we were like, well, we could get Eliza if you want her. Like, we didn't even think of that. And he's like, oh, my God, I love Eliza Dishku. So him suddenly was like, she can be in his house, which she ended up doing, you know, hanging out. She can hang with him. She could drink with him. Cool. This was all this stuff. Bang, we got Eliza. Bang, we got the check. Bang, we made a movie, right? That's just one example. But that's, that's how you do it. The bottom line is all your thoughts should be on making your film. I'm going to get this film done. It's going to be for this amount of money, and you will make it happen. If you just obsessed with it, and it's sorry, you know, I'm telling you to obsess with something, but if you do, you'd be a stalker for your movie. <laughs> so your movie needs to get a restraining order on you, then you'll get it done, right? Um, you know, you, you just can't give up. Don't give up, because it's the people that give up that never do it, you know? We all have the, we all have experienced the high school teacher who could have been a professional baseball player but threw his arm out. Well, that guy's got a story for the rest of his life, and that's all he had, you know? It's the person, I could have been cast in this role, but, you know, I was sick that day, or whatever. Whatever the excuse is, great. You have that excuse for the rest of your life. I don't want to be that guy. I learned a long time ago, I don't want to be that guy that's telling the story of I could have been a professional NFL player, or I could have been, I could have been an Oscar winner, but the timing was bad, man. You know, I just decided I needed to support my family. My mom was a professional singer and gave it up for, uh, to have kids. You know, and that was her choice, but that was a fueling fire to me. Part of my whole life was that was a fueling, is that she gave it up, and I always felt that she missed out. She, she, I could feel that she felt that she missed out on that, you know? And it was a fueling fire to me saying, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be the, you know, the guy that's, uh, that's 20 years down the road. That's the frog in the boiling water that one day looks back and says, what the hell did I do with my life? You know, I need to do something right now. So do it now. That's the one message I can give it to you, is that whatever you have, do it right now. Don't wait till one day, one day ain't coming. Do it right now.